Okay, and we're live. Um, I want to uh, I want to welcome everyone to the first ever Forward Thinking. It's a series we're launching here at Forward with the goal of bringing together leaders from a diverse set of backgrounds to discuss today's most important issues. And of course, what could be more important today than discussing COVID-19 and particularly how our country can reopen safely and start the recovery process. I'm Adrian Aoun, founder and CEO uh, here at Forward, a technology-enabled national preventative healthcare system. I'll also be your host today, and I'm joined by several, um, several very illustrious doctors. We're starting with uh, Dr. Sarah Cody, health officer and public health director of Sarah, uh, Santa Clara County, which under her guidance was the first county in the country to order shelter in place, and thus a great success staving off what some people estimate to be about 20,000 COVID-related deaths. So excited to hear from you. We also have Dr. Uh, Jim Kim, founder of uh, Partners in Health, former head of HIV at the WHO, former president of the World Bank, president of Dartmouth, and now vice chairman of a private equity firm, Global Infrastructure Partners. We'll get to hear how he's been advising the WHO and several federal governments on their COVID response. And we're also lucky to be joined by Dr. Bob Wachter, Chairman uh, of the Department of Medicine at UCSF. He's been on the front lines of delivering care in a hospital setting, quickly learning what treatments work or don't work with their COVID positive patients and disseminating that by what has become a fairly famous nightly or now every other nightly Twitter post. And last but not least, we have Dr. Nate Favini who runs medical here at Ford and can tell you how our medical team has been helping keep our members safe as well as caring for COVID positive patients in the safety of their homes using remote patient monitoring technologies. So first off, welcome, really excited to have all of you. So um, I know we have a lot to get through, so let's dive right in. So you were each uh, active leaders in the earliest stages of this pandemic, whether, whether deciding policy for countries, counties, or healthcare systems. I'd love to hear a little about what you've been seeing on the front line. Bob, in the early uh, pandemic, UCSF geared up, whether it was PPE, ventilators, clearing the hospitals. What have you seen since? How has it developed over time? Thanks, Adrian. Uh, yes, the, the early days were scary as hell. Uh, we all felt like we were standing on the shores waiting for a tsunami to come in. The response of the organization was spectacular. And we have gotten somewhere between lucky and good, I think a little bit of both. And thank you to Sarah for her leadership and mm -hmm. part of part of this that is good uh, the decisions of policymakers of corporate leaders and I think of the citizens of the Bay Area have been fantastic and we've uh, seen a fairly light hit 40 deaths in all of San Francisco six deaths total in UCSF um, we're still seeing a mild uh, number of COVID patients about 13 14 in the hospital each day uh, it's been pretty stable for several weeks the test positivity rate is down to about 2%. So the vast majority of people who come in convinced they have COVID do not. Um, the biggest issue for us, like all healthcare systems right now is recovery uh, in March and April. Purposefully, we essentially shut down everything we could shut down. And uh, that worked very well. We had lots of capacity and now we, were, we are losing somewhere between three and $5 million a day. And so we're trying to figure out how to ramp back up, which has something to do with convincing patients that they shouldn't be scared to come and get health care, which they shouldn't be. I'm actually more fearful when I go to the supermarket than I am when I go to my hospital. Uh, and also the visitor policies were, were a big issue and they have just relaxed in San Francisco. Then that's going to make a big difference. Some people did not want to come in because they couldn't be there with their loved one if they were going to have a major surgery. So we're doing okay. It's a hugely challenging and stressful time, but I'm uh, actually quite proud of the organization and we feel very lucky and blessed that uh, we have escaped the worst of it. That's great to hear. So so obviously one of the things that you're, you're finding the impact is, is clearly that the economic impact on UCSF might be larger than the COVID impact. Now, Sarah, this is something that you had to uh, you had to weigh, and it's it's a very hard decision to make. Um, you ordered the shelter in place far before it was popular. I can't imagine that that was an easy call. So I'm a little curious. How were your orders received, and what were the challenges at the time? Well, the the irony I would say is that issuing the shelter in place in mid March was a piece of cake uh, as compared to trying to figure out what to do now, um, how to phase reopening, how to ensure it's, it's safe, um, how quickly or slowly to go, 
and um, how to decide what comes next and, uh, and um, you know, with, with what information. So I would say, I, I mean, I'm thinking back to late January and the challenges then uh, were trying to learn as best as we could from information that we were reading uh, from around the world um, and then taking our best guess as to what might be happening locally. And our concerns at the time were, I was thinking back to 2003, when we, we in Santa Clara County had two of the eight uh, SARS cases in the United States. And I was thinking if this is an emerging infection uh, in China, that um, it would be more likely that we would, might be an area of the country to first begin to see um, infections. But the challenge was that we didn't really have the tools to see it was a very strange time as though we were proceeding with a blindfold on, kind of sensing that there must be something going on, but unable to see. Um, and that was really, you know, it really wasn't until early March that we began, like very, you know, tail end of February uh, in the beginning of March, when we had testing available in our public health laboratory, started doing a small amount of testing and wherever we looked, we saw. Uh, and that gave enough, um, really enough data in combination um, with looking at the epi curves around the world to, to take action. Now it's vastly more complicated, <laughs> you know, so vastly more complicated because, um, you know, the, the really, I say that many of the conditions on the ground are not changed. Um, you know, we don't have herd immunity. We don't have a vaccine. Uh, what we do have is a much more robust infrastructure in terms of testing and contact tracing. So, so I feel that the shelter in place has enabled us to build some pretty good guardrails. Um, uh, but now we have the challenge that uh, we've all been sheltering in place for a long time. There's been, you know, incredible social and economic disruption. Um, and now how do we phase things back uh, we want to, of course, go quickly because we want to mitigate um, all of the distress, but we don't want to lose the progress that we've made. Um, and we have to ensure that the guardrails that we've put up are robust enough um, to keep us, uh, to keep us all, all safe. Um, and this is all, of course, done in an environment of a very federated system uh, where it's uh, state by state, county by county, um, which uh, adds to the, to the challenge, really. That's great. So um, one thing, uh, one thing that a few of you have mentioned, is, in particular, Bob, you mentioned the notion that UCSF has been losing between three and five million dollars per day, and that's just one example of kind of large economic damage, but also the damage of you know kind of lack of lack of access to healthcare. So I want to turn over to Nate for a second. While most primary care in the country was shut down, you decided to keep our doors open. What's the role you were hoping to play during the pandemic and what technologies allowed us to stay open while others had to close down? Yeah, we, so we were really one of the earliest primary care groups to respond in the pandemic. We, were, we ordered PPE in January when the World Health Organization was still, I think, trying to reassure people around the world that this wasn't gonna be a pandemic. Um, we, um, we had testing live in all of our locations around the country, literally on the first day that it was available outside of state public health labs. Uh, and we've tested thousands of our members uh, over the, the last couple of months. The way we did this was we, we built an assessment tool in our app that basically allowed our members to tell us about the symptoms they were experiencing, to tell us about the risk of exposure that they had had. Uh, and we actually had a 10X increase in usage of our app um, at the end of February, beginning of March, when this all started to, to hit. And we were able to handle that because of our technology and not overwhelm our, our clinical teams um, because of those tools that we built. Um, it also let us understand what was happening in the pandemic pretty early. We have a nationwide footprint. Uh, and so we could see, for example, that people around the country were reporting symptoms like, um, like cough and sore throat and so on but also that our members in New York were having higher rates of things like fever and shortness of breath, uh, and that they were also telling us that they were uh, more likely to have been exposed to someone with COVID. Uh, and so we took that to mean that there was more transmission happening in New York. Um, and that it was pretty clear that was happening in particular in the week in between 
when the Bay Area County shut down and New York City shut down. So we were prepared for New York to be much worse than our other locations. We were able to move resources to New York and, and that actually turned out to be true in our testing. We, we saw 60% in, in March and April, 60% of the members we tested for coronavirus in New York City uh, tested positive whereas we were seeing positivity rates in the in the 20% range in San Francisco uh, and uh, Los Angeles, and more like 5% in places like Orange County, San Diego, and so on. Um, and New York has now come down. New York, New York has now come down to under 5%, um, but it took two months for that to, to happen. Um, so, so we were prepared for the coronavirus, and to your point, Adrian, we never, we never closed our clinics. Um, we felt that it was really important to be there for people who wanted to be evaluated in person, who needed to be evaluated in person. We wanted to keep them out of the emergency department, out of environments where they might be at higher risk for exposure. Uh, and then we also launched a telemedicine platform uh, forward at home, which allows our members to have video consultations with their doctor, see our smart screen uh, on their own computer uh, and continue to receive really great comprehensive primary care without having to come in uh, to, the, to the office. So, um, so we've cared for people with coronavirus and without coronavirus through this. Um, we're now, I think to Sarah's point, we're now trying to help people navigate this new complex world, uh, assess their own risk and the risk of the environment that they're in, whether the things that they're hearing from their local health department are sensible uh, or not. Um, and um, I'm really proud of, um, of our team and the way we've responded. Um, but I'm also I'm also concerned that we still have not that we've not used the the period of shelter in place uh, to build out the infrastructure that we really need to come out of this well economically. Yeah, so we're starting to uh, we're starting to open the country. It's obviously a little ad hoc. So there's this question of like, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Now, Jim, you've been advising not only the U.S. but also Hong Kong, Korea. Um, and others who are a few months ahead of us in this journey. So what should we be learning from them? What are the takeaways that, uh, that we should be implementing now? Well, Adrian, thank you uh, for having me. And, and um, just so everyone knows, I'm not hanging on a cliff at Machu Picchu, which is the background, but I let my kids decide the background. I'm on so many of these calls. And so that's a photo I actually took uh, in, in Machu Picchu and I worked in Peru for many, many years. Uh, but, you know, I'm, act, I, I'm not advising uh, the governments of Hong Kong and, and Korea, but I'm in touch with them. And, and uh, uh, early on, I had a call with the Korean CDC. And, uh, you know, back in 2003, uh, I was, um, I ran the campaign of Dr. J.W. Lee, who uh, in January of 2003, he won election as an ex-director general uh, of the World Health Organization. And so, I was in charge of his transition, and that was right at the end stages of, uh, of SARS. And so I got to know the folks who were running that response, which was really incredibly well done. And I'm sure um, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Walker and Dr. Cody remember those days. It was incredibly mm -hmm. well done. And, the, and, and WHO had the absolute um, uh, uh, audience, I mean, it had the ear of everyone. And so I sat there and watched it. And uh, Mike Ryan, who's now uh, the executive director in charge of pandemic response, and I became very good friends. I've worked with him now on, on several pandemics. And so in talking with him, I kept saying to them, but w w why have we given up on containment? You know, th at a time in the United States when there were so few cases, I mean, frankly, uh, Dr. Cody, if the, if the U.S. had done what you've done, and said, okay, now what we've really got to do is get the testing right and get our contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine systems up and running. This could have been a completely different story. And it wasn't just, you know, the, the, the problems with the federal government. Those have been well documented. The public health people gave up. I, I, I just couldn't believe it. And, and there was a whole group of public health people who were kind of interested in doing this big herd immunity experiment. I mean, I remember watching 60 Minutes and and somebody I know said, look, this is going to infect everybody. We're going to have herd immunity soon enough. The, the, the uh, death rates are way exaggerated, and this should be fine. Uh, and, you know, Bolsonaro in Brazil is saying exactly that right now, right? He, he's saying things that were said by uh, public health experts. And so I was, I was saying, but there are no cases in Montana. There were two cases in Florida. Why are we giving up on containment? And from my experience, and, you know, I... 
uh, my whole career was on tackling uh, infectious disease problems that the public health establishment said were impossible to tackle. And you guys remember 1996 when we got antiretroviral therapy, you know, the Lazarus effect. And so from 96 until 2003, we kept saying, okay, let's do this in developing countries. There's 25 million people in Africa who are going to die unless we do this. And, you know, by 2003, when I went to WHO, uh, we had a, a, you know, a, a fixed dose combination bills that was one in the morning, one in the evening. And the entire public health community, you guys remember, the entire public health community said, impossible. You can't possibly do HIV treatment in Africa. I'm sorry, you know, they're all dead. Uh, with very few exceptions, Tony Fauci being one of them, right? And so, so um, I saw the whole thing happening again, and we were giving up. We were saying, oh, you know, there's community spread, so it's just impossible to do containment. And only now, after we started the Massachusetts program, about, you know, probably now eight weeks ago, did people, uh, are people understanding the importance of what I've called the five-part public health response. It's, of course, it's shelter in place. It's, it's social distancing, but then it's testing, contact tracing, isolation and quarantine, and of course, treatment of the ill. It, th those are five things are the only things that have suppressed the virus and contained the virus anywhere in the world, right? And the rest is just magical thinking, right? It's, if we get a vaccine, <laughs> great. But this is a funky virus, man. This is a funky virus. And I, I you know, I, I, how many cases of Stevens Johnson are, are we gonna see, uh, you know, where, where, where these kind of, you know, Peter Piot, former head of uh, UNAIDS, he didn't have a cytokine storm until after he left the hospital and he'd been tested negative twice, right? And so Peter is saying, oh my gosh, this is a funky virus, guys. Don't assume that we're gonna have a, 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 a vaccine right away. And so the thing that's been driving me crazy is that for some reason, uh, we've just decided that the standard public health response, the only thing that's worked in any of the countries that have suppressed the virus is something that we're just not gonna do. And, and wh why would we just not do it? And so anyway, to, to make a long story short, uh, seeing that, I called Tony, I called Tony Fauci and I said, Tony, what are we talking about? Are you really saying that all we can do is mitigate? All we can do is flatten the curve? Don't we also have to do testing, tracing? I, he said, of course, Jim, you know what? This is the fifth thing we've worked on. Of course we have to do it. But, but in a perfect world, that's what we do. We're just trying to get uh, the government to agree to any kind of shutdown. And I'm worried that if we uh, lose that battle, uh, we're, we're, the hospitals are gonna be overwhelmed, right? So you can see, you can see I'm, I'm very, look, I left the World Bank, I left Global Health to try to build infrastructure in developing countries. That's my job now. But I was, what I was seeing in front of me was exactly what I saw with HIV, exactly what I saw with MDR-TB, drug-resistant tuberculosis, which is what we started before HIV. The public health community kept, came out and said, oh, we can't do it. It's too hard. It's so expensive. You know, I'm, I'm in, in Massachusetts right now. I'm in the middle of an argument where people are saying, oh, contact tracing is too expensive. You know, you spend $40 million on it. And, you know, I'm used to, you know, uh, 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 many, many billions coming out of the world. Bank. I'm saying, are you guys completely crazy? What are you talking about? We've spent $3 trillion trying to, to, to put in place fiscal and monetary policy, mo much more than that if you include what the Fed has done, to, to take care of a problem that's actually a public health problem. We've spent nothing on the public health response. And so now what you're seeing is public health people arguing with each other about a few million dollars. You know, the fact that the public health community has not come out and said, this is the uh, 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 pandemic of our lifetimes, and whatever money we spend on trying to stop the public health problem is going to be nothing compared to what the cost is going to be if we don't do it. So uh, I, that's what I'm seeing. Uh, in Massachusetts, the good news, you know, it's a high prevalence country. It's, you know, we're having thousands of cases a day. This is so hard, you know, compared to doing HIV treatment in Haiti, Lesotho, Rwanda, all of which, you know, I've worked on all of those things, uh, you know, doing contact tracing in, in Liberia and Sierra Leone for Ebola. In, having, after having done all of that, this is uh, one of the hardest things I've ever done. Uh, first of all, because the insurance is all screwy, right? Everyone has different insurance. We have to figure out who to call, when to call. Uh, but, but what we're feeling is that we're doing what every single health system that's been successful 
has done, and that is get to the level of the virus and stop transmission. So we're, we're, we're not there yet, but we think we're going to get there. And eventually every state in the United States is going to have to have this. You know, uh, there's no magical uh, story that will get us out of having to build those systems like Dr. Cody, just, just as she was talking about the guardrails, every single uh, state, every single locale is going to have to have this because the coronavirus doesn't look like it's going away. And what, we lear what we've learned is that a virus can bring down the global economy. Once you know that, then you've got to go back and say, okay, you can think magically about a, you know, a, a, a medicine that's going to cure uh, the, the virus uh, or a, vi a vaccine that's going to come sooner than anyone can, can imagine. You can, you can think that way. But then you have to put your feet on the ground and say, okay, but, but what's the one thing that's actually worked to control the virus? And it's, it's the full response. So, so that's absolutely wonderful. Thanks for kind of uh, giving us that framework. So I want to turn, I want to turn back to, uh, to Dr. Cody for a minute. So Sarah, you're, you're on the ground. You're, you're the one trying to implement these technologies in your, uh, in your county. What have you struggled with? What do you see out there and say others, you know, this technology exists, this technology doesn't exist. Like what are the things that we need to bring to bear brass tacks for you to be able to kind of reopen your county or other counties across the United States? Well, to be honest, I think that one of the most important things uh, that's an absolute must uh, that we have in pretty good shape in Santa Clara County is a highly functional local government. Um, you need a highly functional local government where people know each other, collaborate together, and problem solve. Uh, you know, pu public health is a multidisciplinary effort. It is highly collaborative, and you need a highly functional local government because with infectious diseases, um, it's no one sector's responsibility to control an infectious disease, but that is the role of government that is the role of local government and i think that um that i believe is one i mean it has been in you know super 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 hard but our uh i i'm so delighted to hear you uh, dr kim you fill my heart with your words <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> really because I begin to feel like, 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 am I the one that's like not thinking straight? You know, you know, sometimes it's a very, it feels a little lonely. Um, but the idea is that we missed our first opportunity at containment because we didn't have the tools in place. And so then we did this, you know, massive, massive, massive shelter in place for mitigation so that we could suppress levels like this, hold our hand on this um, until we get it down to a place where we can go and have some chance of spotting every fire and extinguishing it, spot a fire, extinguish it. And, and that we need to have the infrastructure and just the sheer workforce in place um, to be able to do that for probably a pretty long time. Um, I, I also think that it's, um, I remember at the beginning when we put in shelter in place, uh, we stated as our goal that it was to protect uh, hospital capacity, to protect healthcare systems so that they could care for people when they were sick for COVID and prepare for anyone else who was sick with whatever else. That was our, our, our core mission. Um, but now that we've learned a lot more about this um, crazy virus, uh, we know that what we really need to be doing is preventing infections not just preventing the disaster they call, but preventing the infection. And since we have so, you know, such a high proportion of asymptomatic spread, that means that the uh, surveillance systems, they have to be super robust uh, in order to be able to do, uh, to do containment. And, and really it is an invest, you know, it's a huge investment that needs to be uh, made uh, into, into the infrastructure so it's interesting because now we, you know, I, I am um, uh, getting a little bit of feedback uh, from a few sectors uh, <laughs> for, for, for going slow. Um, ultimately, I think that it's better for our, for our health, you know, in every way, if we just um, uh, do go a bit more slowly in a measured fashion so that we can ensure that our containment is working. Um, and, uh, and if we could just, um, 
inspire a bit more investment in that infrastructure, that would be uh, enormous. So that's uh, so that's that's wonderful, and I strongly, strongly agree. So one of the big questions that's on everybody's mind is, what are the next few months going to look like? Like, do we believe that? Do we believe that infection rates are going to rise? Do we believe that the hospitals are going to get overwhelmed? Do we believe that anything has changed or not? Bob, I know you've been uh, you've been kind of uh, theorizing about this and and posting tweets about it regularly. I wonder if you could kind of summarize that for us. Well, I, I agree with everything I've heard that that we needed to slow things down in order to create the capacity. And the early days were, you know, capacity on the workforce side. Do we have enough ventilators? Do we have enough PPE? Do we have enough tests? And now we're in a position where, at least in Northern California, it feels like we're in pretty good shape. Um, and so, to me, the real test of the next few months is around is. It's more around policy and sociology uh, than it is around medicine and science. It really is, do people have, do people believe the data? Do people believe the science? Will policymakers look at, every time you uh, open something up, you are doing a test you're, and you can pass it and fail it. And if your measure of failure is we're seeing hospitalizations, you've screwed up because you d didn't catch it two weeks earlier when you needed to catch it. If you're looking at death rates, you're three weeks late. And so the question is, do you have the infrastructure in place to be able to look for those, those embers? And then do you have the political wherewithal and do you have the populace sort of on your side to say, we this is not a partisan battle, this is not shirts and skins. This is not wearing a mask tells you what political party I'm with. This is, I believe the science. I believe we have to try to open up, but if things are getting worse demonstrably, then we know we've got to shut things down again. And I think the question, I just have very little doubt that in San Francisco or Santa Clara, and Sarah says the testing is showing whether it's, it's, it's random tests or it's you're, you're checking the sewage or whatever it is you're doing or fever curves are going up. It's looking like we're going off the rails here, folks. We've got to shut things back down. I have no doubt that she will do it. I have no doubt that the citizens of the Bay Area will say, I believe you, I will go back in. I'm not happy about it. I enjoyed going out, but nevertheless, it's the right thing to do. I'm a little concerned about many other parts of the country where this now appears to be sort of a, you know, you're making a political statement about whether you're following the science. And if you don't follow the science, you know, in New York, 20% of people probably are immune and the rest of the country, it's probably 5%. So those other 95% are no different than they were three months ago and the virus is no different than it was. So if, if I think the difference may be that we won't see the massive conflagration like New York City, we will see multiple small breakouts in smaller cities and in rural areas. And they may have numbers that are smaller than what we've seen in New York, but on the other hand, if you start having a breakout in a city that's got a 80 bed hospital and three ICU beds, you've got a disaster on your hands. So that's the part that worries me. I think in the Bay Area, we're likely to be fine because I do think we now have the infrastructure available to do the early warning. And I think we have got courageous political leaders and I think we have a citizenry that's primed to slow back down if that's mm -hmm. what we have to do. So there's been much discussion of how certain reopening strategies will uh, will disproportionately affect minorities. Interestingly, we've also seen data that shows that COVID um, has also dis, uh, disproportionately affected minorities. Can uh, can you walk me through this, uh, uh, Doctor Doctor um, Kim? Can you tell me like how should I think about the trade-offs there? It's easy for us, some of us to say we should stay at home. The reality is we're we're probably still making our salary, but for many folks the world's just not that simple. But, you know, the, uh, uh, the economic toll is just, it's devastating. And, and uh, uh, you know, if you look at um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the selectivity of this virus, I mean, it's one of the nastiest ones in the sense that, you know, if you're poor, if you're living many people to a household, um, African-Americans are dying at a rate that's 2.6 to three times higher uh, than uh, than white Americans. I mean, the the the, um, the the virus has shown its preferences for who it's going to go after, which is why, by the way, I think this whole uh, the the playing with uh, herd immunity that so many people are doing is just so incredibly dangerous. Because you know what I say to them: this is not herd immunity. This is herd culling, and we know exactly who you're going to cull. And frankly, there are some political elements that kind of like the idea of the of uh, of, uh, of letting it just go. 
But I, I, I think that um, uh, the, the differential mortality that we're seeing across the United States, we, you know, Partners in Health, the organization we founded, we also work in the uh, Navajo uh, uh, country. And I'm, I'm telling you, the differential mortality is grotesque. And this is why for us, you know, in Massachusetts, the contact tracing program has turned out to be a support program for uh, people from communities who cannot go to their fifth bedroom and quarantine themselves, right? Uh, it, we're, we're now providing food support. You know, the dormitories and the hotels are more necessary uh, for the people who are at greatest risk, who are actually out doing these essential jobs. And so for us, it's like, you know, it, it, the, the, the term that we came up with at Partners in Health was accompaniment. Uh, we've used community health workers to tackle incredibly complicated health problems and have found that uh, our, our outcomes, our outcomes for drug-resistant tuberculosis and HIV were so much better in Haiti and Peru and in Africa than they were in many hospitals in the United States because we use community health workers to go see people every day. And so that's sort of the program we're putting together in Massachusetts. And what we're finding is that the poorer you are, I mean, there are just extremely high rates of COVID in, in some poor communities, the more you need the support that comes from the contact tracing program. And so, uh, you, you know, um, uh, part of this fight, part of going after uh, the, the virus at the level of the virus, and as Dr. Cody said, stopping transmission. For a long time, the idea was, you know, transmission is not such a bad thing. I mean, people really believe that and really believe that the Sweden model of letting the infections happen was gonna be a, a, a good one. I, I, I don't think there's any evidence of that. I think there's also lots of evidence saying that herd immunity is not something that we're gonna to get to without going through many, many more deaths. And so, uh, you know, the, the, it, it's not just a public health issue in this case, as all health issues are. At some level, it's a deep social justice issue. If we don't support the people who are most at risk, as effectively as we can with the best treatment, but also uh, when they are get when they get sick, make it possible for them not to infect their family members. Uh, then you're going to continue to see very high mortality rates, and it's going to affect uh, the, the 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 poorest, uh, you know, um, uh, people of color. It's going to affect those communities in a way that I think we're going to look back on and say, "Oh my God, that's 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 what happened when we, as public health people." you know, uh, uh, started saying, oh, it's so hard, it's so difficult, I can't do it. I have to tell you, you know, when I see, um, uh, you know, so, so, so Dr. Bob and Dr. Sarah, uh, I don't think we've ever met, but we know so many people in common because so many people from the Brigham, from Harvard Medical School have been out in San Francisco. We, I, I just, I know we know dozens and dozens. And I have to tell you that um, the, the, the mode that's taken on by physicians facing this problem is so different from the sort of establishment public health community, right? Physicians, you, you know, those who are taking care of you, actually, they, they, you know, and who, who are actually running systems of health are so different from the commentators that, that are out there now who, who opine about whether it's possible to do something, never having tried it, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we have right now. The people who've been opining about whether an aggressive public health approach that puts in place all the things that, that uh, Dr. Walker, Dr. Cody have been talking about have been, have been making grand projections about what is or is not possible without ever having tried it, right? And so I wish uh, those people would just shut up and let, let the folks get on with the work <laughs> of protecting people. Okay, so that's awesome. So one, this is a great segue. Um, I'm definitely inviting you back next time, I, I assure you. Okay, well, I'm so, take, um, Dr. Walker, Dr. Cody, come on, you guys are actually trying to run things, actually trying to take care of patients, actually trying to stop this, this virus. And, you know, every night, you know, we, we see self-appointed uh, uh, experts saying, well, you know, kind of we think it's really just too difficult. I mean, are you kidding me? Right? Are you kidding me? Uh, uh, Bill, Bill Fagey, one of my heroes, you guys I'm sure know who Bill Fagey was, head of CDC. Mm -hmm was the guy who came up with a strategy to, uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, eradicate smallpox. And he wrote a little letter uh, in an in a, in a, in a, in a obscure journal saying, gee, you know, when we uh, you know, ended smallpox in India, there were 1,500 cases a day in one state in India. And we had to have tens of thousands of, of uh, contact tracers trying to find everybody that they'd been in contact with. Now we had a vaccine, but that was really hard I just don't understand why people in the United States are saying we can't do what we did in India 
you know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, it, it, this, is, this is one of the greatest failures right now of this country. I just can't believe how much we're giving in uh, to the virus and not going on offense, going after it. So I couldn't agree more. So let's talk about solutions. So uh, Dr. Favini, you're in a unique position in that you're not only uh, leading a medical practice, but you're backed with uh, dozens and dozens of engineers um, that basically will build whatever you say is the right thing to build. So tell us as a country and as a health system, what are the things you need right now? I, so I've I've personally been a big fan of the Paul Romer testing plan. I'm sure you've I'm sure you've seen this, Jim. You know Paul well. Um, I think it's I think it's the kind of plan that captures the the imagination because it's so ambitious. Uh, he's you know he's calling for testing on the order of 165 million people a week, so that you could test everyone in the country every other week uh, and literally have you know surveillance of the entire uh, population. Uh, in terms of their their COVID status and understand if they have the virus uh, before they're symptomatic, um, and um, Adrian and I wrote a wrote a piece talking about building tools on people's mobile phone that would let you show the results of your test in order to um, to access uh, things like public transportation or large sporting events, so that you know that you've had a negative PCR test in the last seven days. Uh, to allow you into those types of uh, those types of events, and um, you know, our argument has been that it's it's the balance of you see this working successfully in in places in Asia. China is obviously doing it in a way um, that's much less transparent. It's unclear how you get your your QR code status, right? Whether you're red, green, or yellow. But if you did this in a transparent way in the U.S., that it was uh, you know administered by healthcare providers. Uh, and you could use your code to scan into these types of events um, or places. Uh, and if you test everyone on a regular basis, you could pretty dramatically impact, um, impact confidence uh, and get people uh, back towards doing something uh, that looks like their normal lives. And, and the cost of this, Paul Romer's estimated the cost of this at like a billion dollars a year. Uh, it would obviously be worth it in terms of the, the benefit uh, to the economy. And, um, and I think it, as much as I believe in, um, in contact tracing and isolation, and I think we should be doing all of those things, um, I think it might even be more effective um, because, of the, because of the limitations of, um, of finding uh, asymptomatic uh, cases. So one thing we're doing is we're talking a lot about solutions, yet we're not really saying where they should come from. Should these, should these sorts of solutions be coming from healthcare systems, uh, health systems? Should they be coming from governments? Should they be coming from NGOs? Should they be coming from tech companies? I'm going to open this one up to the floor. Where do you think these things should come from? How about history? How, how about the actual experience uh, over many, many decades of actually tackling pandemics and bringing them under control. How about that, right? Uh, and and it, because it's like, it's it's you know in 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 every place where they've been successful, they've just done the standard approach, right? That's all they've done. This is not that there there was nothing. Okay, so in Korea they did use apps a bit, right? So so uh, you know I I was asked to do a, a show about why the Korean baseball organization was able to open and MLB is going to have more trouble. And the bottom line was that because the Koreans have their uh, pandemic under much, much better control. There's 49 cases yesterday. They closed down the entire city of Seoul, right? These folks are serious. And when they opened up the bars and the nightclubs, that, was, that, may, may, that may have been a little bit too macho, machismo, you know, too much machismo there. I couldn't believe they did it. But they now believe that they can run down every single infection. So Adrian, I, right, and, and Nate, on, on the Paul Romer plan, of course, he worked for me. He was chief economist of the World Bank when I was there. And yeah. I don't, I, so it's not a billion a year. It's a, like a billion a day or so, I, you know, maybe, a, but, but that's the scale yeah. that we need, right? If, if someone, a, if I were to go and I'm, I, I've been talking to a lot of the people in, in finance, I said, you know, you guys, don't you get it? This is a public health problem. And if I were to tell the, 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 the masters of the universe, it's going to cost a trillion dollars a year to get this public health problem under control. I think most of them would say, fine, you know, who cares? I mean, we've already spent three, why don't we spend what it takes? But it's that we always go 
to this thing, well, there's limited resources. And blah, blah, blah. This is the one time when you can't do that. This is the one time when you have to say, what has worked? And if that has worked, that's what we have to do, regardless of the cost, right? And, and now we're fighting over scraps at the table. So, you know, you, you guys out there, you're, um, uh, one of your representatives in the, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi, uh, I, you know, the, the Democrats put together a great bill that includes 75 billion for what they call TTTI, track, uh, no, test, track, test, trace, treat, and isolate, right? Uh, the, the first real money in, in any of this, and, and it's been shelved for, for now, uh, but it would be great if we could get the first $75 billion tranche you know, out, out there because right now, um, you know, people are talking about, we got, you know, we're on fiscal policy, just, you know, the money they're pumping into the economy. We've got bazookas, the nuclear option. And, you know, on monetary policy, they're buying the, 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 the worst sub- uh, 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 you know, junk bonds uh, from, from, from the Fed. And, you know, how is it that they're using bazookas and the nuclear option on the fiscal and monetary front? We don't even have squirt guns, right? We're, we don't even have squirt guns to try to put out a fire that's actually a public health fire, right? So, uh, it, you know, Paul, Paul uh, Romer, I mean, I, I think it's a good idea, but you've got to have an infrastructure to feed the test results into just doing testing yeah. is not enough. You've got to do That's something correct. with the test, right? Sarah, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> yes. so, so one of the things that yeah. we're talking it does, about- It does no good to have a test if you're not going to ensure that you can safely isolate the person and that you can trace their contacts and ensure they're safely quarantined. And since most of our transmission is in the communities uh, that Jim was describing, if we don't invest in an infrastructure to support people, um, we'll never get there. We will never get there. And I just want to highlight another another problem that we're so we're a very affluent county, right? We've got a pretty robust government. We've got a lot of philanthropy. We're a very affluent place, um, but we're trying to scale testing, and we're trying to get all the partners together. You know, hospitals, clinics, CBOs, everybody. You know, and here's the guidelines. Here's who you need to test, how often you need to test them. We are having an enormous problem. I'm like, I'm not going to test someone who's asymptomatic. I'm not going to test them just because you said I could. The county should do that. What's the county doing? Where, where's your testing? You know, I mean, the county, you know, the, <laughs> it, it's wild. It's wild. It's like, that's a good idea. Why don't you do it? <laughs> and I guess I'd, I'd add that, that uh, you know, the idea in, until we get uh, reliable tests that, you know, that are saliva based and can be read out in 15 minutes, the idea that we're going to be spending all of our resources and focus on trying to get everybody tested every day or twice a week just seems like a little bit of a distraction. I mean, I just, I, I, I if we could make it happen magically, it would be lovely. But you, you think about the number of their false negative tests, particularly in low prevalence populations like we have in the Bay Area. So there are going to be some of the tests that, that the person actually has the disease, the test is going to come up negative. It's a pretty expensive thing to do. And it just doesn't strike me if I had a few billion laying around, that would be my strategy. I would be focusing on, a, on you need to test asymptomatic people, but in a more epidemiologic public health kind of way, mm -hmm. trying to look for early hotspots, pounce on them, the contact tracing, the isolation, mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff, as opposed to trying to broadly disseminate testing. Now, I think people who are working in nursing homes should be tested two or three times a week. You know, right. a high risk population, to either get the disease or spread it to a high risk population. That's where I would focus my exuberant testing strategy. Other than that, I think we want a more focused strategy than, uh, than something where we're going to test every single person twice a week. It just seems like it's a little unrealistic. I'm going to be one of the naysayers, but no, <laughs> I think that, that that's one that I'm not sure would be the highest priority of the things right. that I would. I think if well, you I, had that I, money, if you had, if you had the money to do, to test everybody, uh, again, I, you know, if you look at the smallpox eradication strategy, you know, Bill Feige is the one who came up with the so-called containment strategy. And they, they realized that they did not have enough vaccine to vaccinate everybody in Nigeria and in, in India. So what they did was that uh, they had a massive uh, information system. And, and this was like, you know, people didn't have phones, and, but they had enough people around so that whenever a case of smallpox was discovered, they would jump in they would test it, they, they would immunize everyone in that village 
And then they would find out everyone who'd been in that village and they'd go find them, uh, vaccinate them and vaccinate everyone around them because there wasn't enough vaccine to cover everyone in the world. And this is also, you know, the, this, is a, this is a harbinger of what's to come. You know, I just saw this crazy uh, poll about uh, uh, with Americans and they asked, if there were a vaccine for COVID available today, would you take it? And only 50% of the American people said that they would ex they would they would get the vaccine. So th there are all kinds of all kinds of complexities here, but I I I, I agree with, uh, with with Bob that that if we had enough money uh, to do that many tests, I would not put off having actual people as contact tracers. And that's the other thing we've learned: contact tracing is very it's a very sensitive thing, and so we have to do a lot of sensitivity training with our contact tracers. We hired uh, 1,500 of them. There were 40,000 applications because people need work. They also want to contribute to, to this process. We hired 1,500. And there were some that would just didn't have the social skills to do it. And we got complaints and we had to remove them. So uh, it, it's not, you know, um, what the Koreans did is only part. I mean, you hear, well, you know, if you come close to a person who's been positive, you know, alarm goes off on your phone. That's true. But they also uh, called them and talked to them and supported them, right? So you, it's going to have to be a person-intensive uh, uh, kind of effort. There's no app that's going to solve the problem. And I, I tell you, I've had so many apps sent to me, right? And 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 Adrian, and I've kidded you about this. Everyone's excited about their app, right? And it's almost like, okay, now it's your responsibility to figure out how to use my app and your program. Mm -hmm. That's not helpful, right? I mean, it, it, what we need, and I told Adrian, I told you we're going to do this as we go forward, as we discover problems, we're going to give them to you and say, how would you help us solve this particular problem? Uh, you know, so far, uh, you know, um, th there are some interesting data that says that even if you only get to 50% of the contacts, you're still actually having an impact on transmission. And so, um, uh, you know, people who say, well, you're only going to reach 50%, you should just quit. It's just idiotic. You know, we're going to have to continue uh, plugging away and build these systems everywhere. Like the, the, the system that Dr. Cody built, that's going to be a requirement in every place in the United States. Let's just keep, let's so, keep going. So let's kind of go okay. down that path. Can I? Just, just one. The the case that I the case that I I want to make for a more ambitious testing program is not a case that um, that contact tracing doesn't work or that we shouldn't be doing that because I'm an absolute believer in those things. But I think that we've I think that it's evident that we failed to successfully market shoe leather epidemiology as like a solution that's getting massive buy-in from the public. And I and I know that testing is something that people want. There's demand for testing. And I almost feel like coming up with a much more aggressive and ambitious plan that's aligned with what the public wants to see uh, and something that resonates is a way to get the ball moving in the direction of what we need. I'd, I'd rather they market masks cheaper, easier, and probably more effective. Yeah, obviously uh, the counter to that would be that masks are uh, masks are being adopted now, but in a couple months, you you can imagine that people will tire of masks in a way where uh, where employers can mandate you know testing to come into the office, etc. But I want to switch gears because we're talking right now about uh, we talked about the past and we talked about today. But let's talk about the next few years, right? So you all have seen pandemics before. You've you've studied it. You've lived it. What's the uh, what's the long term going to look like for us? What what's daily life going to look like in a year or in two years? And how will the world change from this pandemic once we do get through it? Oh, that's uh, <laughs> I'll I'll start. I mean, so much of it depends on therapeutics and and vaccines. And uh, I, I'm I'm I'm. I'm voting for there being an effective vaccine in a year and a half and and there and therefore a year after that many high risk populations will be vaccinated, although certainly not everybody and some people will turn it down. Uh, but but it does feel like all of the early milestones that we needed to tick off in order to be on a path toward a vaccine seem to be going in the right direction. That's no guarantee that we'll get to the finish line, but I think it's more hopeful than it might have been a few weeks ago. I think the question is, you know, the, do people tire of this? Do people get a nerd to the risk? 
it's really remarkable if you look at how the goalposts have, have, have changed. If you said three months ago, we're gonna have 100,000 deaths in the United States and the best projections say 100,000 more by September and people would say, and if that got you know, dampened down so that it's only 80,000 by, and people would say, okay, we're doing great. I mean, that's unbelievable really. If you think about the way, I guess, you know, humans are capable of discounting death and discounting their health. And I think particularly getting at this disparities issue, you know, having lived through HIV and seeing the political response when it's other people and I'm not at risk. When COVID started in the beginning, it was like, it's all of us at risk. And as it becomes clearer that there are certain populations at greater risk, then people have this ability to sort of say, oh, those are others, it's not me. And therefore I don't, I'm not gonna focus. So a lot of it, I think so much of this depends on the political response and whether we can keep up people's uh, energy and enthusiasm for saving their own lives and saving the lives of others. And the tension with the economic turmoil is real. It's a very, very hard thing to, uh, to work through. But I suspect that it's, it, it's going to be quite heterogeneous in the country, that certain areas like the Bay Area will have a very different flavor than what this looks like in, you know, in other cities and other parts of the country. Let's go to Sarah. Sarah, what do you think it's going to look like in your county in a year? To be honest, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think um, what you know. One of the one of the concerns I have is uh, it's very much been a response led by county government. Um, it's been a whole a whole of government approach in our emergency operations center. We have people from everywhere in the county workforce who are laser focused on one goal, and I'm concerned because I don't know how the entire uh, county infrastructure can stay laser focused on COVID uh, when there are so many other responsibilities of a huge, you know, safety net uh, health and social system. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, thinking about that. Um, I think, uh, you know, I hope there's a vaccine. And then I think we have to think about how, how we're deploying, uh, how we're deploying vaccine and try to learn from uh, uh, H1N1 where we had some hiccups. Um, and I think really key is to keep um, to keep the public in, engaged and to communicate frequently and clearly. Um, that's going to I think that's going to be one of our primary challenges, but really important. And I think it's especially challenging because the environment it you know it changes every day. Every time there's a press conference by an elected official in you know a, in a you know, either within the state or in an adjacent state, then all of a sudden things erupt uh, locally and the public gets confused and the more they're confused, the less they are uh, to go along. Um, so I, I, I have a hard time predicting what things will look like, uh, honest truth. So let's, let's take a different approach and let's try uh, predicting what is the healthcare system gonna look like? I know demand, demand has changed, what consumers are looking for has changed. Let's start with Nate and then maybe go to, uh, to Bob. What do you think the healthcare system is gonna look like in a year? Um, I'm afraid that not much will change, um, but, I, but I think that it's, it's an incredible opportunity that's in front of us in some ways to rethink the way we do healthcare in the country. Um, you've got unprecedented um, unemployment uh, and remember that we have we have an employer-based healthcare system here in the United States, uh, and there's never been in my mind a better time to break the connection between um, uh, someone having a job and them having health insurance. Uh, and I hope that you know, a lot of this will depend on um, what happens uh, in November. Um, but I hope that there's an opportunity to to change the way we do uh, health insurance um, fairly dramatically. Um, uh, and I think, um, you know, if, if you ask me how I do that, I would, I would personally try to combine some of the best elements of consumer driven healthcare, where you give people money, say like their first $5,000 that they're going to spend on healthcare and then back everybody up with a high deductible single payer national plan so that everyone has coverage for catastrophic expenses, uh, that they might, um, that they might, uh, suffer. Um, I tend to think that's what insurance is best at is preventing those, um, sort of big financially catastrophic events. But I think it's largely up to, um, it's largely up to the people of the country uh, through our political process to decide whether we take the moment to, to really make dramatic change. And Bob, what do you I think, think it's I, gonna look like? Go for it. Yeah, um, 
I, I think I'm like Nate, I'm skeptical that the healthcare system will be completely transformed. It is a very resilient system with a uh, group of stakeholders, including doctors, including big academic medical centers, both of which I, I am not very much part of, that, uh, that, that are wedded to the status quo. It's worked pretty well for them and are, as I've told people who've come in to disrupt us digitally, uh, doctors are better lobbyists than taxi cab drivers and get ready for a little bit of a fight. And so, um, you know, and we've seen that with, uh, you know, IBM Watson not playing out as well as people hoped and Haven not playing as well as well. It's not uh, that easy to disrupt us. I don't believe even with the, uh, uh, the connection to of employer-based insurance that the country's going to have the stomach to go to a single payer system or do something that big and ambitious as it's trying to plow out of the depression. You might argue that would be the time that would do it, but I, I'm guessing it's not going to have the focus and the energy to do that. I think the game changers here is to, telemedicine is the biggest game changer in the healthcare system. I think that truly, we, we did about five years of transformation in about two months. And the reason I think that will be sticky is all of the parties have said, oh, I actually kind of like it. Patients say they like it, they're not going back again. And physicians who are one of the biggest sources of, of pushback have said, actually, this is kind of cool. It works pretty well. And so I think telemedicine as, as an enabler of a more digital and more continuous and population-based experience for patients. I think that's real. I think a lot of our visits will be telemedicine, not 70% the way they are now. It'll go back down to 30 or 40, but not two the way it was before. And that then enables like, okay, how do we monitor you at home? And what is this sort of digital, you know, digital scale and digital glucometer and digital, you know, and how does that all link up and how does it all weave together into something coherent? That feels like a real and fairly transformational change. The big systemic changes in insurance and all that, uh, or will medicine get religion and say we got to cut out waste and stop, you know, and, and stop spending money on stupid stuff? I'll believe it when I see it. And the big challenges, of course, are we now need a whole bunch of money for the public health sector. And where's that going to come from? It's going to come out of the acute health care system, but the acute health care system is pretty good at fighting that stuff. So it's it's going to be tough. I think telemedicine is the big the big game game changer out of this. Okay, so we've spent we've spent the last hour talking about all the problems that come with COVID. Um, in the last sixty seconds before all of you have to go, does anybody want to offer the the optimistic view? What good is going to come out of this? Well, how's the world going to change for the better? I, I might start. You know, as uh, from my perspective, as I as I felt like I saw everything kind of fall apart in terms of our our government and the government agency's ability to respond to this, I was incredibly inspired to see our team of of engineers uh, and product managers and operations people come together to build a product that could really um, help meet people's needs. Um, and I think that it's it's the people who are on the ground who are doing the work to respond to it um, that really make me hopeful. That's awesome. And one last person, Dr. Dr. Kim, give us some optimism. I know it's tough, but I know you can do it. Well, um, you know, the, 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 one of the great lessons uh, is that uh, humility turns out to be really important in, in tackling something like, you know, the worst uh, pandemic in more than 100 years. And so what I found is that the, the countries that are humble in the face of a nasty virus, uh, who uh, talk about it almost as, as if it were a person. I mean, the Koreans were talking to me about it as if it were a person, sneaky, nasty, goes after you know the weakest people, hides in the strangest places. Uh, you know, the, the, the people, the, the humility and solidarity are the things that are going to uh, be the most important for success against the virus. And so that's a great challenge. And you know, I'm looking at some of the questions on the side. And, and, and a couple of them, I think, very rightly bring up this idea, well, you know, we're Americans and we're different and we left those places that are more authoritarian. You know, look, I, I have a PhD in social anthropology. So, and I, I studied Korea for my uh, PhD dissertation. And the stuff that you're hearing now about, oh, well, you know, the Asians are just different. I, I, I just think that's baloney, right? I, I think that what, the, what made them different is what made New Zealand and Australia different they had a much closer upfront look at the SARS outbreak and they were scared, it scared them, and they prepared themselves. I don't, you know, are you really gonna say that New Zealand and Australia also, well, they're Ireland, all kinds of excuses you can make, but the one thing they did was they were humble, 
in the face of that virus. And so, you know, I, I, my understanding is Dr. Cody put in place this, uh, a shelter at home that was pretty strictly observed. But in the rest of the United States, you know, um, uh, 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 Germany in an eased uh, uh, lockdown is so much stricter than any place, maybe except for Santa Clara County, uh, ever, ever was. You know, the, 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 the humility in the face of the destruction of the virus because you feel a sense of solidarity. Wearing a mask, not because you're trying to protect yourself, because you don't know in the last four days if you might have gotten infection and you want to protect everyone else. You know, uh, uh, to make this race about humility and solidarity, I hope brings about uh, a lot of good things in society. We'll see. You try, to, you try to think about the word cloud in the United States and whether humility and solidarity would show up high on the list. I'm <laughs> not very high right uh, now. Hopefully <laughs> that's, hopefully that's you know, the case that will carry us forward. And with that, we're unfortunately out of time. This was fantastic. I'm sure we could spend hours and hours further talking. We'll invite you back on next time. I really appreciate all of the time that you all have spent today with us and with all of our participants. And with that, we'll say uh, have a good rest of your day to everyone. And thanks for uh, tuning in. Bye, folks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.